into that, but I will say how I connected with him. Mark Little I found through social media because I just saw this good looking brother with a sharp suit on and I like to dress nice myself and I had to step up my game when I got around him. But he had posted an ad through Facebook, not a, a, a shout out, but an ad in Facebook and it was a commercial ad for his book because he's an author among other things called The Prodigal Republican. And I got a hold of that book, I met him, I had him on my radio show last year, I've had him back this year with my new radio show with Dr. Eric Wallace, thank you so much, Eric. And, um, and it's just a riveting testimony, and when he gets up to speak to you today on the subject matter at hand, we have a bit of a change because we had scheduled Chris Jasper to be here, but we couldn't make that happen. I'm working on getting his new CD out to everybody, so don't hate me. And, uh, but a powerful testimony of forgiveness, overcoming, and moving on with life. Mark T. Little Esquire is an author, he's an attorney, he is a community organizer, I mean that, he works with the movers and shakers in Southern California and builds that bridge between the faith-based community and the government, and he works on both sides of the aisle, but he is a staunch Republican and they're respecting for that. He's the executive pastor for, if it's not the largest black church in Southern California, certainly up there, they used to own the fabulous forum where the Lakers played, so it's a big ministry. And he's doing wonderful work. Welcome to the podium, Mark T. Little, Esquire. Good afternoon. It's still afternoon. Uh, I said to Pastor Hoy that uh, after that and after that question, I've just been messed up. It's a topic very, very dear to, to our hearts. My, my wife, as she said, uh, is a leader on the ministry at our church called No Longer Bound, and we deal with men and women who are recovering from uh, the regrets of having an abortion or a miscarriage. And so I'm now trying to gather myself and get back on point, because that really is a, an issue for our community that I wish I had known Pastor Hoy was preceding me. I would have asked to switch the order, because uh, I can talk about that all day long. I want to set my time so that we are on our way to lunch on time. I want to thank Eric Wallace uh, for doing this yet the second uh, Black Conservative Summit. I joined him in Chicago last year and I'm so privileged to have been invited back. I must have said something that was all right. Uh, I want to thank uh, my good friend Lonnie Poindexter who's come alongside Eric in the uh, conference this year, and I met Lonnie, as he said, in his work with uh, Cure. I do want to thank my friend Ken Blackwell, with whom I serve at Cure with Star Park. It's so good to see you as well. Uh, and to the bishops, Jackson, who I think have left the room temporarily, uh, but they really set the stage, and I want to apologize because unlike Bishop uh, Harry Jackson, I'm not going to take a text. Uh, but uh, that, that's wonderful. Uh, I do want to let you know that uh, I do have a book online through Amazon called The Prodigal Republican, Faith and Politics. I didn't call it The Prodigal Conservative because it didn't ring as well as a title, uh, but I am a committed conservative, less so uh, as a Republican. Uh, we know if we've paid attention over time how those things have changed, and so I'm committed to value and not party. Amen? Amen. I want to just quickly uh, talk a little bit and give you the title of, of my talk, and it's really Call 911. It's an emergency. And I bring that to you with a slightly different geographical perspective in that I'm from California. And so some of what I will share has a lot to do with, ha with what's happening uh, in my state. Uh, but before I begin, I do want to acknowledge, though, the national crisis that we're in as a country. And I want to give honor to the men and women who are now serving in Syria and Iraq uh, during these airstrikes. They are our last line of defense for our liberty. And I'm so very pleased, although many say he's a day late and a dollar short, 
every opportunity I get to applaud President Obama, I do so. And so I'm thankful that we now have an offense and a strategy against what clearly is an affront to our liberty here in the United States. Can we get a round of applause for that? <laughs> Again, it's, it's, it's not often. Uh, and before I get into the heart of my uh, talk, I, I wanted to recognize that there were some uh, candidates for office. Glo Smith is here and others. And I have to tell you, as Lonnie alluded to earlier, uh, I, I work in a community that is represented by all Democrats. And as a Republican, I have to interface with them. And I want to just share with you, if you're not a candidate, and there are candidates here, it's really important to support those who are in elected office, even when they're Democrats. I've learned that if you don't have relationship, if you don't support, no matter how small, sometimes I have to sow a seed, but relationship plus support equals access. If we don't have access, we are not able to grow and impact our communities. It took me a minute to get to that place because our pastor teaches us to sow good seed in good soil. And I struggled with writing a $100 check or a $200 check to someone who absolutely believes opposite from me. But I quickly realized if I'm going to change my community, when I make a phone call, someone needs to pick up. It's just the truth. It's just how it works. We had something coming down in California where they were trying to uh, reduce the standards for practitioners who perform abortion. Down from a nurse down to the lower level. And we said, well, we're not for abortion. That's clear. But we're certainly not for reducing the standards and increasing health risks to women. And because of my relationships and because of my support, I was able to make a phone call and say, you're going to have a real problem from this church and from this side of town. And that bill did not make it out of committee. We have to understand how to move the needle and how to grow and change our communities. It's not about party. It must begin to be about relationships. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. All right, so the title is Call 911. It's an emergency. Firstly, it's directly related to uh, the administra administration's politically schizophrenic agenda of open borders during a time of war. I've not heard anyone talk this morning about amnesty and illegal immigration. It is a crisis for the black community. Unlike our friend Jeb Bush, who thinks that it's a matter of love to cross the border, I'm conservative, clearly Jeb is a moderate, it's not an act of love, it's a breaking of the law. <laughs> and as someone earlier said, uh, LG, uh, 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 President Lyndon Baines Johnson said, we're going to have these Negroes, he used the other term, voting for us for the next 100 years. I believe President Obama absolutely believes that amnesty is going to have these folks voting Democrat for the next hundred years. And if you look at the statistics in the polls, those who are immigrating are big government liberals. They will absolutely annihilate the Republican Party. The second battle is for education. I'm going to get into these things more in detail. The second battle is for education, the push for common core. 
and the stubbornness across the country to deny students the right to escape failing schools through school choice is sure to doom the black community. These two issues are the largest issues facing the black community today. And I'm not diminishing the attack on the church as Bishop Jackson talked about, and I'm certainly not diminishing the genocide that has been happening uh, f certainly before Roe v. Wade, but certainly now in numbers in far excess, now 16 million black babies aborted is certainly genocide. Not to diminish those things, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on illegal immigration and education. And I'm here specifically as I was preparing to come, Lonnie said, Mark, I want people to come to Washington DC and I want them to not just hear a good talk but I want them to be able to take something away with them when they leave. And so I've come simply to make you mad as hell. <laughs> if you recall the saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. And the more and more I plan to speak today, the madder I got as I went through the statistics of where we are as a community and what is happening on our watch by people who say they represent us. And so those of you who are candidates today and those of you who will go on to elected office, yes, you'll be in relationship with me. Because I'm mad as hell. And I don't plan to take it anymore. We need to change our communities. Because there is an agenda that is sidelining us in a way that is unspeakable. We need to take our voices back. Now, I was told I have 30 minutes by Eric. Now, has that been changed? All right. Okay, fair enough. I can speed it up and get right to the point. I'm, I'm fine. Either way. All right, I'll, I'll speed it up. I'll, I'll, I'll skip the statistics. We should no longer allow the NAACP to wield our voices. We should no longer allow self-appointed black leaders to show up and exploit situations, take a check for their charities, and go home. We should not allow our elected officials to show up for photo ops and then leave our communities. While, and by the way, and, and I'll be at the Congressional Black Caucus, as I told you, I interface with all of these uh, Democrats in California, uh, and their districts are changing demographically. And so they are currying favor with those that, that they represent, all the while making us believe that they still have our best interest at heart. Has anyone noticed that we spend over a trillion dollars a year in entitlement programs, and our communities are still broken and poor? We have to take our voices back. We have to stand up and do this ourselves because there's no one doing it for us. Amen. I'll say amen on that for myself. Uh, we have to take ownership of our own destinies. I talk in the Prodigal Republican, and I won't get into my story, but I, I was shot at USC and gunned down by a crip and lost my leg as a result of it uh, and decided not to be on entitlements and decided not to be a victim and decided to take my destiny into my own hands. I went to law school and now I run one of the largest churches in Southern California as well as an attorney and other private enterprises. But that's what I'm talking about in terms of just taking your future in your own hands. And so, by the way, it's a four alarm fire. Brother Hoy talked about a fire and pulling people out. It is a four alarm fire. And we are sitting around on our couches watching Jerry Springer. <laughs> while all around us, our community is being annihilated. We have to take our future back. And by the way, it's important to know who the arsonist is. The arsonist is the progressive. 
The arsonist is one who believes that we are to behold, to be beholding to big government, to the nanny state. Self-reliance will be a thing of the past. They're against profit. They vilify business. But yet, they sell cable stations and they fly around in their own private jets and make hundreds of millions of dollars while telling us that profit is bad. Keystone Pipeline, shut down by environmentalists. A job creator, we can't do it. Silent, uh, 1962, Silent Spring. 100,000 children are dying a day in Africa because a Silent Spring in 1962 got DDT wiped out, which cured malaria. Now in Africa, it can only be used on the inside, not on the outside where mosquitoes are breeding, all because of progressive environmentalism. These are the arsonists, and we have to pay attention. So when you see Obamacare happening, when you see the nationalization of education, these are progressive ideas. These are our arsonists. Pay attention, please. It's very deliberate, and it's very real. So number one, we must stop amnesty for illegal aliens and secure our borders. Illegal immigration is the biggest job killer for black men, uh, but is supported by the NAACP and the Congressional Black Caucus. Illegal immigration is one of the largest contributing factors for the decline in the labor force participation rate. Currently, it is 12% for blacks and 80% for whites. In 2008, under this current administration, the United States Commission on Civil Rights examined the impact on illegal immigration on blacks. The witnesses were unanimous that illegal immigration has an adverse impact on black employment, reducing job opportunities, and depressing wages, especially for black men. Yet we are days, if not weeks away, from President Obama granting amnesty to millions of illegal immigrants with no opposition from the one community harmed the most. We are days, if not weeks, away from the President using executive order to grant amnesty to millions of illegal aliens with no opposition from the one community harmed the most. Call 911. We must stop Common Core. Common Core is an experiment that one size fits all in education. I started a charter school in Los Angeles called the Proud Preparatory Academy. I see how government controls districts. I see how government controls our school. It's about money and incentives. That's the answer. Unions and taking government out of education. That's the answer. It's not nationalizing education. They fought to keep us in schools. Sorry, they fought to keep us out of schools before Brown versus Board of Education. Now the schools are detention centers and they fight to keep us locked in them. They're modern day detention centers. And if you're not fighting for school choice in your area, you're missing the boat. And I'll tell you the NAACP is right along with you. In Durham, North Carolina, about 2,400 students from low-income families would receive up to $4,200 a year in taxpayer funds under their voucher program to help pay for tuition at private or religious schools. More than 4,700 students had applied for the vouchers for 2014 and 15 before the program was stopped. Here's what the NAACP said. 
Reverend William Barber. The voucher plan is old wine in new wineskins, saying that it smacked of 1970s style North Car uh, 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 North 1970s style efforts in North Carolina to evade court orders calling for the desegregation of public schools in the state. Their students cannot get out of failing schools. The NAACP is leading the charge. Finally, be an advocate for public charter schools such as mine. You should know that Forbes has reported that students are 7 to 11 percent uh, more likely to graduate compared to their peers in district-run schools. And then you have the mayor in New York shutting down charter schools, Mayor de Blasio, three of them, in black neighborhoods as payoff for the unions. Where were we in the streets when this was happening? We're stuck in low-performing schools. This is something we should be marching about. So let me give you some practical solutions and then I'll close. Get mad and organize. We should be filling the mall on Washington on these issues, plain and simple. After Obama does the executive order, we're done. If we think that for one minute as, we, as Republicans that what didn't happen for Reagan will happen for us, we're crazy. When Reagan did amnesty in 86, he didn't get any support. It's not going to happen. So it, as a political response, that's foolishness. There'll be no Latinos or others who are crossing the border voting for Republicans, period. It's foolish and it hurts the black community. Call your elected leaders. Let them know how you feel. At the end of the day, if they don't understand that you oppose it and that they're at risk, they'll keep doing what they're doing. Have relationship. Call right. Let your voices be heard. And then finally, you've got to value education and have a work ethic, as I talk about in my book. At the end of the day, if you value these things and put God first, getting mad about these things will come easy. Thank you so much. I knew he would bring it. Um, <laughs> I've seen him in action before. Another resounding applause for uh, Mark T. Little. <laughs> That's right. Do we have any questions? I'm sure there's got to be questions after that. <laughs> Only two. two. <laughs> Oh, hi. Ahead. Sorry Go about that. Go ahead, Dram. <laughs> I'm, from, uh, I'm from San Diego. Yes, San Diego. Yes, we've come a long way to be here, to be with you. And sure. And uh, my question is, with the churches, you know, you're bringing up a lot of issues here. And uh, so many of them have brought, been brought up today. School choice, charter schools. You just don't hear the churches talking about this. How do we get the churches to do this? I tell you, as a, a church leader, uh, they said earlier, I sold the forum to Madison Square Garden. I'm quite, quite involved in a uh, local church community. And there's no easy answer to that because our churches today uh, revolve primarily around building churches and saving souls. And then you have a handful who are into community development. And in that case, it's a, more about economic, empow economic empowerment. Uh, it's, there's, it's a rare pastor who uh, will talk about, as Bishop Jackson said, the righteous issues or the social issues because they tend to divide the church. And if you're talking about the black church in particular, um, they are predominantly Democrat and liberal. And so what you have to do is you've got to write a book like I did. You've got to get on a show with, with Lonnie. And you've got to make yourself heard in other ways because if we continue to just rely on the church that is typically um, uh, personality-driven, we are then back to allowing people to carry our voices. We cannot allow one person to carry our voice. We have to be responsible for, for letting others hear 
that we are disenchanted with where we are. And we have to go beyond the pulpit. What you can do is speak truth to power and try to empower your pastor to let him know that you support this particular view. Just like with the elected officials. I've learned, and elected officials said to me, and I, I compare it to, to pastors, well, why should I stand up and take your issue to the legislature when I come back to your community and you don't vote for me? So we have to let our pastors know and let our elected officials know that we support them. We'll be there with our money, we'll be there with our feet, and we stand for something, but they gotta know. Most of the pastors are walking around just assuming that they know their flock. Mm -hmm. Just like the electeds. Mm -hmm. They assume that they know what their district stands for mm -hmm. because they're historical you know, liberals or they're historically black or historically democratic, uh, democratic since 1965. Uh, and so it's, you, you gotta let them know. And that might empower them to come out of their own comfort zone. Absolutely. Uh, first, I wanna thank you for bringing up the amnesty issue. Um, I've been mad, so I'm with you. And I just wanted to share just another little bit of information. Um, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago has implemented a policy where they are setting aside jobs specifically for illegal immigrants. So these are city jobs yep. that are being set aside for people who are in the country illegally. And the black citizens and the white citizens of Chicago who are US citizens cannot even apply for those jobs. So this is bigger than Obama. When you go back to Ohio and Cleveland or wherever city you live in, you need to pay attention to what your local politicians are doing because they are doing us all in. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Let me make a quick